Good afternoon. Welcome to this live event. My name's Oliver Shipp and I'm from Oxford Health. And today's event is going to focus on digital consultations. And what we mean by that is when you have a consultation between a, a patient and a clinician, um, but that is done using a video rather than in person. And in particular, what we want to talk about today is the patient's experience of those digital consultations. Um, so for everybody who's watching this event, just to say we are recording it. So um, if you do enjoy it, want to recommend it to anyone else um, or, or watch it again, then it will be on the Oxford Health website uh, later on. And also to say that we're really keen to hear your views and experiences as patients using digital consultations. So if you want to use the question and answer um, facility, uh, it is if you see the slide here on the top, well, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen, that's where the live event Q&A is. And if you need to access that, you see the button that's shown here with the question mark on. If you click on there, that opens the, that side panel. So please do, if you think of a question, it'd be really great if you could put that into the into the questions. So, um, and finally, just a reminder to our speakers today that you do need to unmute your microphone to speak. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Marie Crofts, the Trust Chief Nurse, who's going to chair the session. So over to you, Marie. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I feel absolutely privileged to uh, have been asked to chair this event. Uh, clearly, patient experience is something very dear to my heart and um, something that I've been involved in for many, many years. Uh, as Oliver said, I'm chief nurse within Oxford Health and have been at Oxford Health in that role for about 18 months now and previously been a chief nurse in other trust. I'm a mental health nurse by profession and this is probably my 36th year in the NHS as a mental health nurse. Uh, I guess, like everybody, the last few months has been um, a challenge, but also an incredible opportunity for us to look at how we deliver services and things have really changed in the last few months. Um, we know that we've got lots of learning from the first wave of COVID, which we're now trying to put in place. And this event today, I think, will be really um, fascinating. So this event is one in a series of Health Matters events, which are organised by our membership team. So this one is open for all and not just our members. Um, we really do hope it inspires those that have joined that aren't members to become members. Membership is free and you've got no obligations as a member, but we, we encourage you to get involved in many different ways and help to develop our services and influence our services as, as a member of the local population. Uh, in this event, we do want to focus on patient experience of digital consultations. Um, we're very close now. Um, well, we've actually achieved 100,000 digital consultations, which is our latest figure. Um, I, I think we're up to about 102 um, consultations, 102,000 consultations, sorry. So that is incredibly different to how we were working back in um, January and February of this year. Um, a lot of things you might have seen in the NHS have actually changed and what we um, sometimes the NHS can be a slow moving vehicle in terms of change uh, and actually what we've seen over the last few months is things that are probably would have taken us two to five years to develop and I think this is one of those things where we've moved very quickly because of the situation to digital consultations and I think Oliver might tell me um, and correct me later but I think we're uh, sort of the leading trust in terms of the numbers of digital consultations that we've held. So our clinicians and patients have been able to adopt this way of working really quickly, which I think has, be, has, has helped in terms of the, what the pandemic's meant for us in terms of infection prevention and control and keeping both our patients and our clinicians safe at all times as our priority. Uh, as I've said there, we know there's lots of benefits to digital consultations, um, but obviously we started from a premise of being safe and reducing any risk of transmitting the virus between each other and, and um, between our, our patients, our service users, families and the staff. And it gives people a much more flexible way to access care, reduces the time of cost and travelling. People often both, both um, 
patients and um, staff, it's very stressful trying to find where places to park. Um, so I think overall there's many benefits, even if the premise to start with was around reducing um, uh, in terms of transmission. So uh, we know we're doing a lot of consultations, as I've just said, but we're really interested in is how good they are. So as the chief nurse and having been a nurse for 36 years, I'm really interested in, in how this is for our patients, our service users and families. So we want to put that at the, at the heart of this as we do um, in terms of everything that we do in the organisation. So I just want to highlight the channels in which you can feed back and I really encourage feedback so we can use that in our models of, of uh, delivery and interacting um, going forward. So we have a number of patient and care experience groups. Those of you that know those, please feed into those. Those of you who don't, we'll be putting some um, information in, in the chat box. We have a system called I Want Great Care where people can feed back their experience of care. So if you have been on the receiving end of digital consultations, please, please, I'd encourage you to feed back. As I say, we can pull that information all together. We also have two current surveys specifically related to um, your experience of digital consultations and we're publishing um, at this event and online. So if you can have a look at those, that would be great. I, I just want to encourage everybody to, to feed back because the more feedback we've got, as I say, the more we can then look going forward and learn from that. Um, because we do know we do have to think about those people that can't access um, a sort of digital platform and what we actually do um, there and patients that might make it that, that feel that it's more difficult or don't feel like they want to. So, so any any feedback is helpful feedback. So today we have the privilege of hearing from four patients. So I'd like to thank those um, patients that have come forward and have recorded those short videos about their experience. As I say, we can learn learn a lot from those and or and the other feedback. So thank you to Lisa Parker Smith, to Mrs. Kay Perkins, to Peter and Cheryl for sharing for sharing their experience. I'd also like to thank at this point. Um, the patient care experience coordinator Nicole Robinson who recorded these videos and the head of quality governance Jane Kershaw who supported the membership team. I am I have overall executive responsibility for patient experience so as I said at the beginning this is very very close to my heart. Today we'll also hear from cognitive behavioural therapist Natasha Brown and global digital, digital exemplar lead Oliver Ship that you heard at the beginning of the webinar, who've both been very much involved in making our trust one of the leaders in digital health. So thank you to you both. But first we want to um, look at our patient stories, which is very important. Our first one is from Lisa Parker Smith, who's been supported on chronic fatigue syndrome. So I'd like us to have a look at that. Thank you. When did you first have a digital consultation over Microsoft Teams? Got me now. Yeah, um, 5th of August. Okay, that so was, that was the first one. OK. And, and then it was on fortnightly after that. Uh, when it first started, there was a little bit of a hiccup. But then again, who isn't experiencing that with this new way we have to do things? But once Mandy had got that sorted, it was just it was brilliant. Yeah, it would have been nice to actually sit in the room with the people and actually see them. And a couple of times there were tears and I wanted to get up because I'm a bit of a hugger. I wanted to get up and hug people. But then again, I got the feeling that there were some people on the course that preferred this way. So I think it worked brilliantly for both sides, really. How do you find it compared to a face to face consultation? Personally, not too fast because it's it, I found it easier than talking on a phone because I could see Mandy and I could see the others at all. In fact, I thought it was quite ingenious way of doing it, actually. Do you, do you have any comments on how we can improve the experience of the digital appointments? Do you know what I? I Again, I don't think there was any way. Um, it was clear. Um, there weren't any glitches. Um, unfortunately, do you know how you can make them longer? Uh, we all wanted to do so much talking um, that there didn't seem to be enough time. And, and, and you could see Mandy trying to sort of like rein us back in again. Um, <laughs> so that was the only thing I'd suggest to make them longer because we were a particularly chatty group with lots of ideas for each other and lots of empathy towards each other. So, um, yeah, 
just longer. I didn't realise how badly you could get CFSME. Um, and during it, I almost felt like a bit of a fraud because there were some people there that were really, really poorly with it. Um, and I actually said that, but Mandy and the other guys really reassured me that this was my experience and that's the way I had to treat it. So finally, at the end of the course, I thought, you know what, I've got this. There's nothing I can do about this and I have to deal with that. And that was something that I really, really took away from the course. And I can really feel a difference in myself. Wow, isn't that great? Thank you so much for that um, experience, for sharing that experience, Lisa. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it was great, great to hear um, the, the, the positive experiences you had. And we're also very interested in, in hearing about how things could be even better. We're going to go straight on to a, another patient experience now. This is Cheryl, and she's going to share with us her experience of speech and language therapy. So over to Cheryl. Um, please could you tell me when did you first have your uh, digital consultation or appointment? About a month ago. About a month ago. And how often are you having these digital consultations? Um, the last week it was twice, but weekly average. And how is your experience with the digital consultations? Very good. It's like being in a classroom with them. Would you say it's just as good as meeting face to face? Yes, it is. Um, what can we do to improve the experience of the digital appointments for you? I think really, I don't think it's very good. Well, that's good news. <laughs> it's encouraging me. A lot of people have said how much better they can hear me now since we've been doing it. So it's brilliant. My voice is getting louder. I'm going to keep up practicing it because it's very worthwhile. It's a very, very good course. I'm very glad that Lizzie chose me to be on it. 72, I don't think it's actually asked to join in a course like this before. This is much better than just being on the phone because on the phone you can't, you can't see the person. You can't see how the expression they're putting into doing things. And uh, with Lizzie, she shows me Gives me examples of how it sounds she wants by doing it herself first, so I can see how the mouth is open and whatnot and everything, every detail of it. It's very good and very encouraging all the time. How many did I think I've done? How well I said I've done it last try my sounds? And so if I say nine out of ten, she says, yes, she's doing very well. And uh, if I've done eight or seven, I think I haven't done well enough. I'll try harder next time. Um. Thank you to uh, Lisa and Cheryl there. Um, I must say it's impressive. I know that's only two um, people feeding back, but um, I think it just shows that uh, in, no matter what the uh, therapy or interaction there, we had two very different experiences in terms of their needs, but actually reporting that they couldn't think of anything that would improve the experience. And I guess we all, um, I think we'd all safely say that we missed the um, personal contact with people, whether it's during our work or, or um, in our in our social lives, but it just shows that we can deliver something um, just as good through digital means. So thank you very much to Lisa and, and um, Cheryl for that. Uh, we have two more videos from patients, but at this point, I think it'd be really lovely to hear from one of our clinicians. So Natasha Brown is a cognitive behaviour therapist with our Talking Space Plus service. And Natasha has been really one of the leaders in our digital consultation programme. So I'm absolutely excited to hear from Natasha. To, so over to you. 
Thank you, Marie. And again, sort of thank you to uh, the previous speakers uh, talking about their experience with using digital consultations. Um, as Marie sort of highlighted before, I have been involved in uh, the project around sort of getting digital consultations up and running within uh, the trust. So it's really exciting to hear patients' experience around how they found digital consultations for them. Um, one of the things that I, I know in, in particular that has been sort of a challenge for us is uh, in light of what Marie was saying earlier today is, is the the change and, and the pace of which this change happened uh, for us all, all those months ago. Um, and I think not only as a trust and as clinicians have we worked really hard to ensure that we can still offer the same level of quality of care to our service users, but also it's a great opportunity to be able to thank our patients and service users who have uh, gotten on board and supported us with this rapid change that we've had to make with moving from in-person sessions to digital consultations. Um, definitely uh, from my experience as, as being a clinician, uh, it's been, there have been a few obstacles that we've had to kind of overcome. Um, I know for myself, I, I, I like technology and I've always been interested by it, but I know for, for many others, technology can sometimes be a bit of a daunting prospect. Um, so again, having the opportunity to pick up the pace and learn and adapt to this new way of working uh, has been a, a massive challenge and uh, one that I feel that we have successfully been able to overcome. It's fantastic to hear that, you know, at the start of the year, we we're only having a few consultations and now we've reached the point where we've had over 100,000 consultations within the trust. Um, for me as a clinician, I think one of the great things about having digital consultations is it still allows me the opportunity to be able to connect with my patients face to face um, and to be able to get a good understanding of their experiences and support and being able to continue to offer that same delivery of care that I would have done if we were in an in-person building together. But I think the most important thing is that ensuring that we have been able to keep our service users and also ourselves safe during this uncertain time. Um, it's been a fantastic opportunity and I'm really looking forward to seeing how much digital consultations will continue to progress. Um, Marie mentioned earlier that there are so many opportunities that, that we can use digital consultations moving forward so from things where you know, travelling to appointments might become quite difficult or finding parking you know, can be quite a bit of a challenge or perhaps our work commitments can also potentially get in the way of us being able to access appointments and digital consultations could potentially be a really good opportunity of getting around those, sort of those hurdles that we could potentially be facing. Um, again, I just want to thank all of our service users who have gotten on board with the change and adapted to this new way of learning alongside of us. Um, your support has been invaluable and your ability to, to take on this new challenge with us has been fantastic. So thank you again for that. Um, so as I finish up here, I think we are going to move over to hear from Mrs. Kay Perkins, who's going to be talking about her experience of having digital consultations as well. And how often are you having your digital consultations? We are having them twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. Are you still having that now? I have set my own up. When we finished our course, there was only three of us left doing it because the others had dropped out due to bad connections or they were happy enough to be able to do it on, on their own at home without the assistance. So I looked online on YouTube and I happened to come across one and I've been doing it ever since we finished. But we now do Mondays and Thursdays, 10 o'clock till 10.45. And then one of us will message each other and we will have a chat, decide if there's anything different that we want to do. Uh, with this now going forward, it's actually helped me with my breathing as well as it's helped another lady. I'm open to sort of trying to get something going like this, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody can move from Catherine and move into something like being run by myself or somebody but everybody is told you watch the video you 
do the exercises and then we talk. And that's what I'd love to do is get everybody joined in. Sounds like you're a patient mentor already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very nerve wracking at first because I had never used this um, computerization like this. I'd only done FaceTimes. Um, but once I got it all set up and what have you, calmed down a bit because my levels shoot up sometimes uh, <laughs> with nervousness. Um, Catherine was brilliant. We had great laughs with her, especially when we couldn't see her, we could only see her feet. Uh, so, yeah, it was brilliant doing things that we've not done before. Um, because it was actually changing my uh, muscle, because it's made me actually use muscles that I didn't know I had. I think if you see a clinical practitioner first and then go down this route is a lot better. Thank you very much to um, Mrs. K Perkins and to all the people that have um, given their experience so far. And thanks very much to uh, Natasha, um, because it's really, really helpful to have your view on this as well as a as a clinician who was delivering services, um, obviously pre COVID, pre the pandemic to what what we, what can a, can be achieved in these circumstances. I, I also think it's amazing really to think about these, just the delivery, who'd have thought we could deliver this this level of service. It's, it is quite incredible. Um, we are all learning, learning as Natasha said, learning together, which is, which is great in terms of the journey. We do have one more video from Peter who talks about his experience of physiotherapy. So it'd be really great to um, have a look at that. Thank you. Well, I had some one-to-one -one consultations firstly that I think were weekly and then I joined a, a class that runs fortnightly. I think it's very good. Um, you know, for the, you know, the particular issue is, is basically physiotherapy and um, I think the instruction works very well. Uh, I think some of the other participants sometimes have a bit of a technical problem with, uh, I guess, broadband capabilities of their internet connection. But um, as far as I'm concerned, it's worked fine. And how did you find the digital consultations compared to a face-to-face -face consultation? Um, well, I've, I haven't had a face-to-face -face consultation through the NHS. The reason I'm having the consultations now is because of my diagnosis with a fairly early stage of Parkinson's. But I've also been suffering from sciatica and for four months I couldn't walk from March to July. And um, when that was getting better, I had some private physiotherapy on a one to one basis. And, you know, I have to say that I think that digital experience is, is just as good, it works just as well. And, and do you think there's anything that we could do to improve the experience of the digital consultations? I'm just trying to think. Um, not really, you know, I find absolutely no problem with it. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know, my consultations are in relation to, you know, one specific therapy, if you like, the physiotherapy. I'm not quite sure what it'd be like if, you know, I had something else wrong, like, you know, a rash that needed looking at or something like that. And is there anything else that you would like to share about your experience of the care that's been given to you by the team? Well, um, as I said, I've not had any care from them on a, a physical one to one basis or or even in a in a group. Um, but you know, they're just amazingly good um, and they seem to work the technology absolutely fine. Um, 
you know, it's it's very congenial. It's good humoured. Uh, they seem to be extremely competent. They're sympathetic to, you know, the situation that we, the the patients in the group, are in. Um, you know, I, I I can't say anything. You know, there's no way that I think it could be improved. Quite frankly. Thank you to Peter. It's really incredible, isn't it, to um, listen to those stories and particularly Peter, who would have thought we could deliver physiotherapy by a digital means? If you'd asked me that in January, I'd have certainly thought that was um, not something we could do. And to, to, for Peter to say again that he didn't think it could be improved and the care team was still very sympathetic and able to deliver that care is really amazing. So can I just remind you to keep posting your questions and comments in the right hand side of the screen and we'll pick those up as we go along. Um, what I'd like to ask um, Oliver Ship now to do is just talk uh, to you about our digital programme. Thanks Oliver. Thank you Marie and yes isn't it great to, to hear firsthand those patient experiences. Uh, just a few words about um, how we've got here in terms of digital consultations. Um, we are something that's called a, a global digital exemplar at Oxford Health and that uh, I think has been really helpful in preparing us for this unprecedented time. Um, we had already invested in things like the technology to do video consultations and also um, a lot of our clinicians were already actively involved in preparing to do this. So I think that did put us in a, in a, a good place to respond really quickly when COVID happened. And um, as Marie says, um, we think we're the first trust in the country to reach this milestone of 100,000 digital consultations. So in terms of the numbers we're doing, um, that seems to be going really well. What we really want to focus on now is the quality of those consultations, and that's the purpose of this, um, this live event today. So um, one way in which we can hear your feedback is for you to put your questions into the question and answers for this and uh, we'll come on to those very shortly. Um, we also there's a few other ways that I think Marie um, mentioned at the, at the beginning in terms of questionnaires and I think we've already put those links in the Q&A section and we might have some slides on the screen shortly to show you those other ways uh, but basically there are there's a questionnaire that you can fill in about uh, patient experiences of digital consultations at the Trust. There's a separate questionnaire um, called I Want Great Care, which is more about the, the, the general experience uh, as a patient. So we'd be keen for, you, for anyone who wants to, to fill that in. And there is also an international study being led by Oxford University Department of Psychiatry, um, and they are putting out a questionnaire and also some focus groups um, to try and understand patient experiences of digital consultations. And we hope that that information will really help to improve the quality even more in the future. So there's lots of ways um, to, to hear your feedback about digital consultations. I think we're going to move on now to the feedback in the question and answers. So I'm going to hand over to Katerina and she's going to pick through the questions and uh, suggest who might be able to respond to them. So over to you, Katerina. Uh, Katerina, you need to come off mute, so. Thank you, Oliver, and hello from me as well to everybody. Um, we've heard from several people today about their positive experiences, so I will start with a question uh, from somebody in the event today, which is, I think, perhaps to uh, Natasha. Has any feedback been received from service users who did not find the digital consultations as useful? For instance, those who dropped out and what the barriers were for them? That's a really good question. Um, so I know um, from on occasions there have been 
those individuals that perhaps have had difficulty or some challenges with uh, digital consultations. And I think where possible, uh, a lot of services are trying to work really hard with patients and service users to uh, understand perhaps what those barriers are and hopefully work around ensuring that we can have safe solutions uh, to overcome those particular barriers with them. Um, I know, as Oliver was sort of mentioning before, we're trying as best as we can to get as much feedback from our service users. Um, it can be a bit of a challenge to, to reach out to those that perhaps have dropped out, um, but where possible, we will always try and get as much feedback as we can. As has as been highlighted today, we really want to ensure that we can kind of find a, a way around uh, those uh, experiences for individuals and think about different ways in which we can improve the quality of the care that we offer, especially in this digital time. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, we also have a question from uh, one of our governors, Mary Malone, and um, I wonder if this is to um, to Marie Crofts. Um, how can teachers help nursing and medical students learn the skills for digital consultations? You are on mute, Marie. I was doing so well with <laughs> my mute button. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, I think this is a really important question because I think this is, as we've seen, is the uh, we've started to do something that would have ordinarily probably taken two to five years, and we've you know done this over a number of months with the help, great help um, and leadership from uh, Natasha and and Oliver and our and our patients themselves. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we build on that and make sure that our workforce of the future, whether it's nursing, AHPs, or our doctors, learn the skills. For, for doing this how can they help I guess it's just it, well um, it's learning so we can bring we're asking for people to give us feedback bring all that learning together as you can see there's sort of international studies going on um, or service evaluation from Oxford University so I think it's bringing that learning and saying then how best can we put that into the classroom I think very much um, and I know we've discussed this Mary out, out, outside of this meeting in our roles in terms of making sure that people students have access to um, working alongside those clinicians that are already doing digital consultations I think at the beginning of the pandemic there was a bit of a oh well we we students don't need to be placed with us because we're not seeing patients as in take you know go face to face or doing clinics and actually what we've tried to say to people is no if you're doing digital consultation that's how you're seeing them so therefore students can learn that so I think it's vitally important we connect students very much into what's now becoming normal and usual practice and just just keep that conversation going and I guess it's with um, the you you know working with the universities to say actually do we need to look at the curriculum and do something specific around digital consultations what's you know doing risk assessments for digital consultations what techniques we we need to teach people so I think it's a great question I think there's lot, lots to be done I don't I don't know all the answers but I think um, working together and based on on the feedback that hopefully we'll be getting I think Oliver's got um, as soon as he leads the program he's probably got some um, and leads the digital strategy board he's he's put his hand up I can see so uh, if we move over to Oliver he might be able to say a bit more Thank you, Marie. It was just to, to build a little bit on, on what you said there about the particular study that Oxford University Department of Psychiatry are leading, because one of the specific early outputs from that study is going to be a training package for clinicians in how to undertake digital consultations. And that's really quite exciting because we don't think that's been done before and we acknowledge that there are things that are different and difficult about doing a digital consultation well and that study is going to look at international best practice and come up with a training package that um, clinicians can access so that they can really do digital consultations as well as they possibly can. Sorry, but back to Katerina, if that's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Maria and Oliver. Um, I think that sounds really exciting. And um, the, of course, the wonderful thing is that we have great connections to the universities, Brooks and Oxford University. So another exciting project uh, brewing up there. 
Uh, we have a couple of questions that are related to the um, accessibility of um, these consultations, and I wonder if you, Oliver, would be the best to answer these. Uh, first one is, how can we use interpreting services with digital consultations? And uh, also relating to that, I think, is could online consultations increase inequality by creating a group of digitally excluded people? OK, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take the second question first about um, exclusion. Um, and yes, I think that is a real concern for us. And we have heard from several of our clinicians that they're worried that whilst digital consultations can be a really good thing and can give access to lots of people, there is a risk that there are some people who might miss out. And we don't have an easy answer to it, but I think we accept that that is um, a problem for, for some people in some services. And we are starting to have a, a discussion about what we can do about it. And the, the, what the, our initial thoughts are that that people might be excluded because they can't afford equipment, IT equipment, or maybe because they can't afford um, the data for a phone or the broadband, or maybe just because uh, for whatever reason it, they might find it really hard to actually work that kit and get online. Um, and what we're hoping to do is to work potentially with our Oxford Health Digital um, um, Charitable Trustees to see if there might be a way of of funding some some uh, trial uh, way of of helping patients who who are presently missing out to access um, that that kit. So that that's one potential way of of doing that. In terms of the question, I, I might need to pass this one to Marie in terms of translation services, or maybe to Natasha because she she will have um, uh, been been using this. Perhaps I, I believe you can use translation services, but I I, I can see that that could be um, a challenge. I, I don't know if um, if Marie or Natasha might be able to take that question. Hi, yeah, I can definitely uh, have an opportunity to talk to you that. Um, so yes, Oliver, you're right. We do have the opportunity of being able to use interpreting services to still deliver digital consultations. Um, for, for, as long as, for as long as I can remember, um, we have worked very closely with a range of different interpreting services within the trust. Um, and they have worked really well alongside us to find ways in which we can continue to utilise their service to be able to uh, offer support to individuals whose English is not their first language. So uh, we still very much do have the opportunity of being able to reach out to those who may have previously found it a bit of a challenge to access our service and we can still do that digitally as well. Uh, so that's sort of my answer for that question. I don't know if Marie has anything further that she might need to add to that. No, I see she's shaking her head there. Um, so I'll pass back over to you, Katerina. Thank you very much, Oliver and uh, Natasha. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Linda Pepper uh, from this event, and she's asking, do you run any group virtual appointments as opposed to face-to-face -face group clinics? So I think, Natasha, maybe you are the best to answer this one as well. Yeah, happy to answer that question. Um, I know definitely in particular in IAPT and I also know in a range of other different services, uh, we have been able to offer the opportunity of delivering our groups digitally, uh, which is a great opportunity. Um, I know initially when COVID first started, it was a bit of a challenge for us. We were trying to figure out ways in which we could ensure that we could uh, ensure that the, the platform was safe for everyone who wanted to come in and join digital consultations. Um, and we found that we've had lots of great feedback from those individuals uh, who have been part of a group digitally. Uh, and I believe a couple of our uh, speakers today uh, who are talking about their experience also mentioned about uh, being involved in what sounded like uh, group sessions as well. I think one of the benefits that we found, again, is for many individuals in terms of the feedback that we've had within uh, IAP services, 
is that it's really offered them an opportunity to be able to attend those sessions regularly. Um, again, whether it'll be from having to travel across different areas across the county to attend a session, whereas actually now they're able to attend a digital consultation from the comfort of their own home and still be involved in that group work. So it's a really great opportunity. We're really happy that we still have digital consultations for groups uh, available for all. Uh, so I'll pass back over to you, Katerina. Thank you, Natasha. It really is quite amazing how this um, support from each other works in this virtual environment as well. Um, we are almost getting to the end of the uh, question or time for our questions and answers. Um, so if there are questions that didn't get answered in this event, we will answer this online. But I've got a question from Mark Jennings in this event, which is quite specific, and I wonder if this might be to you, Oliver. Have any of your services used structured communication protocols, such as SBAR, to improve accuracy, reliability and safety of online consultations? This is uh, quite specific for me, so I'm not entirely yeah. sure uh, enough for what it is about. I have to confess I'm stumped by that question. Um, uh, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll be very happy to, to look at it and try and find out and we can put any response in the um, in the in the email thread. I don't know if any of the other people on the panel can help me out on this one. I mean, I think Marie might do. I mean, in terms of SBAR, I think that is used in, in nursing. So I'm going to hand over to Marie to help me out. And uh, Marie, you just need to come off mute. I, I can't answer the specific question about used in our online consultations, but SBAR is something that we use a, a lot in the NHS, but particularly in Oxford Health. It's a really good, as Mark has said, communication tool for being very specific about what you want to hand over or what you want to record. And it doesn't put improve accuracy, reliability and safety. Um, I, I, as Oliver said, uh, he'd be the person to know if we use it in online consultations or Natasha. So I can't answer that specific question, but I think it's a really good point made and we could go back and have a look at that. Um, be, I mean, generally, in terms of any consultations, we want to improve um, uh, all of those things and, and make sure that the consultation notes or whatever are accurate and reliable. So I think it's just a, the SBAR is a useful communication tool more generally, but I think we can pick that up as something that um, we may want to consider. So thanks for that. OK, and thank you. We are very close to having to start uh, wrapping up with. We did have our one question through social media. And uh, this lady who asked, curious to know how patients could imitate the need for physiotherapy equipment. I wonder <laughs> if you, Marie, could answer that. Um, we saw this uh, video from Peter who had had uh, physiotherapy. And uh, yeah. we got this question through LinkedIn. Yes, OK. I'm not sure I completely fully understand the question. I suppose looking at um, Peter, I think, wasn't it, who had physio? I mean, I, I was completely amazed with that because, as I said, if you'd asked me a few months ago to say, could you deliver physiotherapy like this? I'd have said, of course you can't. That's very odd and bizarre. <laughs> Uh, and actually, um, well, all of those consultations, but particularly physio, they've obviously managed to do that and managed to do that in a way that was really helpful for the patient. Um, he was saying that, um, you know, he felt the care was appropriate, that the care team was sympathetic, etc., and actually felt that it couldn't improve. So I don't know whether that mitigates against having physiotherapy equipment. Uh, and I don't think that we would stop um, a delivering equipment to people if they need it. Um, but that in, co in con combination with the virtual conversations clearly has an impact and certainly for Peter did. So um, again, I can take that back and, and um, talk to the physios uh, about that. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest in any way that we don't ha we don't deliver or we don't have physio equipment for people. But I think it, it would work in combination and clearly it does work. Um, well, according to Peter. So that was great. Thank thanks, Katerina. Thank you, Marie. That is uh, all we have time in terms of questions today. Uh, we will answer the rest uh, online uh, when we publish this uh, event. So I think it's back to you, Marie. <laughs> for the final thank yous. 
Thank you very much from me. OK, thank, thank you, Katerina. Um, I, just in terms of wrapping up, I'd like to again thank all our speakers. So very much thank our service users and patients that are, were videoed as part of this to give their specific feedback. Absolutely thanks to all the communications team that have put this together, in particular Katerina. Really like to thank Oliver and Natasha who've really driven this forward. Uh, you know, I'm here um, uh, chairing this event, but I've had no dealings with the sort of leadership in terms of pushing this forward and I've, I've, I've kind of really impressed with what you've managed to achieve in collaboration with our our patients and service users. What I would like to say is those of you that are on this webinar or and encourage others that you know to really give, give us feedback. We absolutely want your feedback by all these means that we've said and in any shape or form so we can really analyse the experience of receiving digital consultations and then plan and work in collaboration and co-production with our service users to really take this take this forward. So um, as I say, I think it's a massive, um, massive opportunity. As uh, we said at the beginning, we have recorded um, this session and so we will be it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after the event. Um, so I'd just like to say a final thank you to everybody and have a good uh, have a good day. Thank you.